Hey, aloha, and welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studios for another exciting episode of Security Matters Hawaii. Uh, today, we've got one of our West Coast sort of premier integrators uh, on, on this sort of the voice of the integrator episode. Uh, we've got Gary Hoffner. He's not in the studio, but I do have him remotely. I think he's broadcasting out of his office. Gary, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Andrew, thanks very much for having me, man. Greatly appreciate it. Right on. Now, Gary's from PhotoScan of Los Angeles. Basically, everybody calls it PSLA. And I know you guys have been in business a long time out there. Gary, can you give our audience a, uh, maybe a little bit of your background? You know, I know you're a cyber guy. You don't want to share everything, but share as much as you can. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit about the company as well. Sure, sure. So me personally, I'm in my, well, 38th year in this industry. So wow. I've seen a lot of changes. So it's been a while. <laughs> and uh, the, the company, uh, the company, you know, we're, we're a 45, almost 46 year old system integrator. Uh, started out, you know, doing, um, well, actually one of the three founding members of PSA, actually, interestingly enough. So, ah. so um, started out with video, you know, and uh, ended up uh, doing access control and, and intrusion detection and, and eventually fire. And we're known for system integration where we glue a lot of those things together with software to come up with innovative solutions for our customers. So um, in, we're known for unifying the platform and, and giving, you know, something, you know, simple and easy to operate with not as few moving parts as possible to accomplish the, uh, the objective. So it's, uh, it's turned out really well for us. Uh, it, it, it's a great model for virtually every part of what we do. And uh, we've, we've gleaned some very nice, very, very appreciative customers because of our approach. So it's been good. Yeah, yeah. so then, I know that um, system integration sort of came, you know, in the, when we started building, you know, software based platforms back in the later 90s, kind of after back office. And there wasn't, you know, a lot of industry adoption right away. I think a lot of sort of security companies weren't necessarily IT savvy or, or software savvy. Um, did, did you experience that in, in California or were they, was it more of an early adopter? I, from Hawaii, we think of California as this big, huge market. And so I, what were the drivers that sort of brought, you know, system integration into PSLA? You know, I was fortunate. Well, that's a good question, actually. Uh, in my former life, I've only been with PSLA for six years now. Okay. Uh, in my former life, my former company, uh, we were kind of an out-of-the-box integrator. So we were, we were part of a national program with a manufacturer that, you know, we were saddled with uh, their technology and how it would work and play together or or fail to play together I more see. accurately so so you know so so you know working from that knowledge and, and and understanding and appreciating the value from the customer's perspective of actually having a system that 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 uh, operates the way um, many of our contemporary office systems and environments work today uh, really showed us the kind of the past. So over at PSLA, you know, we, we, we are a true integrator where, you know, we actually appreciate the, you know, the, the different uh, platforms, uh, manufacturers, and, and we have a way to marry them together and keep them married so that uh, we can deliver a solution that uh, is sustainable. Is um, the demand high? Like do the calls that you get uh, in your office are, are are you brought in for an integrated solution or do you still get the, hey, we just need a video system. We don't want it to work with our access control or we don't need system integration. How's that, uh, how's the demand? You know, the, the conversation often starts that way, Andrew. You know, we might be called in for a video system or an intrusion system. One of the, one of the four different, uh, you know, uh, technologies that we typically integrate. And, you know, as, as the discussion evolves with the customer is it, it often, evolves into system integration because it just makes sense. There's no sense in trying to operate disparate systems that are doing a very similar, if not overlapping jobs. So for us, we just, uh, we show the value of system integration and how, you know, a camera can, you know, uh, pretty much dictate what happens with an intrusion detection system or an access control system. Uh, and uh, access control and intrusion can dictate what happened with the camera system. So mm -hmm. yeah, we always we have a philosophy that, you know, we rule by exception, uh, we design our systems to manage by exception and essentially deliver exceptions to the people that need it when they need it, so. Yeah, that's, it's a that's really not... important point. You know, you walk into many places where it seems like a system's been delivered and the, 
the operating screen has got 5,000 alarms in it that are not really alarms. They're not really exceptions. They're just normal events yep. that no one even turned off. And so you get this operator fatigue. Uh, I think it, it's critical that we have these event-driven capabilities in our systems today that, that can be filtered down to what's important to the operations of the business. And I mean, I'm just going to say, half the time we get called in, no one's configured it properly. That's uh, that. I would say that's not just in your neck of the woods. <laughs> you know, that things be, that things be you know, you know that, that companies will buy into uh, a certain technology and they'll run it and operate it, and perhaps they're not doing it in the most efficient manner. And you know, you know before you know it, they've got logs uh, that are enormous in size yeah. because of all the false positives they're actually generating. So, so yeah, that's one of the keys is, is uh, in, in our success is to squash those false positives, uh, just rule by exception and deliver those, you know, without fail. That's awesome, man. And, you know, video, Go ahead. videos, you know, I was, was going to say video, had, you know, the evolution of video, particularly in the last five years, has had a lot to do with our success mm. as well, because, you know, I mean, analytics are actually becoming functional, usable, and mercantile where we can actually rely on them to do a job and we have deployments where the video signal is used as an intrusion detection device awesome and in, in pretty harsh environments you know and uh, it works pretty darn well yeah and your your um operating environment is your southern california so you don't have i guess or maybe you do have huge variabilities in in temperature like if you're using thermal in a, in a large you know desert area or something like that what is the range I, um because I mean I don't know LA's huge to my brain California's huge to my brain what what's your sort of operating area there that you cover is it desert mountains uh cities you know farms what's going on in, in your neighborhood you know pretty much all of the above well we're located wow. in Ventura County you know just okay. north of us is a very large farming community okay. and of course just south of us is you know, we're agriculture just south of us is metropolis LA right okay and then uh, all the way down to the you know Mexican border and you know out to the desert on the east and you know to the west we have military bases you know at, ah. at the coast so so we have a there's a variety of of climates there's a variety of requirements there's a definitely a variety of need and uh, it it runs the gamut for sure it seems like um, interestingly you know you talked about a lot of the critical infrastructures that we uh, all like to work for you know they seem to be well funded for I would call it advanced security type solutions. Um, how is the agricultural community? Do you guys uh, get to dip your, your toe in the ag out there? Because that's, that's basically what feeds our country, I think, are all the, the farmlands that start out there. You know, not, not a lot. Um, okay. We, we kind of looked at that, you know, and, and there happens to be, you know, as a part of the agricultural community near us, a lot, a lot of wine grapes, which is, ah. you know, kind of interesting to me. Sure. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, so we were trying to find an angle uh, a while back uh, on food safety, and uh, now that's actually getting some traction. Yeah. And uh, I think the former administration actually had put in place some 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 measures for food safety that we thought would uh, you know kind of open up a market for us. But uh, in terms of agriculture right now, I, I think the thing that's gaining the most traction. Is probably uh, video and uh, other signals via drone uh -huh. and, uh, and and livestock. So you know, measuring uh, measuring the temperature of livestock for for health and things like that. That's interesting. But we we, we haven't done any of that today. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting though. Is um and so you've got a, a healthcare down there. You've got a financial sector. Obviously in LA, you've kind of got all of the businesses. Um, is there a big tech sector down there as well, like you've got up in Northern California that you guys work with? There is actually. Uh, Ventura County is a large tech sector. Uh, oh. In fact, Ventura County is, is a big tech sector. Uh, north of here in uh, San Luis Obispo County and Santa Barbara County, there there are a lot of defense contracts because of the proximity to the, some of the major bases okay. in California. Sure. So, uh, you know, Vandenberg Air Force Base, uh, Point Magoon Naval uh uh, Naval Station, uh, Los Angeles Air Force Base, Pendleton down farther south. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there are quite, there's, there's a there's a large military influence here, mm. and uh, because of that, there also and because of the tech sector, there's a lot of uh, defense contractors in, in our neck of the woods. 
Yeah, that's that's one of the dear ones near and dear to me with the uh, you know the defense industrial base. You know, I work on that with Infragar quite a bit. Is um are those clients moving? I mean, we're you know I know we're we're going to get to this cyber discussion a little bit, but are are you seeing a lot of activity in those sectors for for upgrades or using you know we have the OSDP now and secure channel out to the card reader and a lot of technologies that we didn't have. Um, we're sort of seeing DOD lead with those requirements here. Is that a similar situation in California? We, we find ourselves more frequently educating our customers yeah. as to OSDP, for example, and secure channel. Um, you know, I, I, I would say that uh, most of the deployments up until, I would say very recently, from our competitors, uh, and and it was, we've seen to see out in the field a lot is still you know weak in communication and oh. pretty pretty low hanging fruit with the card technology. So, wow. So you know aside from you know the OSDP, we we always profess you know a, a much higher grade of security on the on the card technology as well, even yeah. if it's for a in a commercial client. Yeah, I think that this year and next year we're going to start to see this. The proliferation of of that requirement for secure channel it's um obviously as you know it's expensive to forklift access control and i know our customers like to get that 20 year you know life out of it but um i i i feel like there's going to be a lot of uh forklifting which has not happened you know in our industry in the past decades in the way that i think it's going to have to happen now yeah yeah i i, I agree with you uh 100 I, I think there's this compliance factor that's coming down from above, you know, and, and I, I think it's going to start making a, a very large impact on some specific verticals here in the next, I would say, 24 months to where we're going to start seeing, you know, these customers coming to us saying, hey, you know, we need to consider this technology and what can you do for us here? And yeah, I, I, I believe that uh, it'll be commonplace or OSDP pretty soon. But you know, Weekend's been around for what, 40, 42 years? Yeah, I mean, I mean it, it's- uh, Yeah. Yeah. Everybody got their, so they got their money's around. worth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt, yeah. Okay, well let's, um, we'll, we'll take a short break, about a one minute, we'll jump out and pay some bills, and we'll be right back with Gary Hoffner. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Yukari Kunisue, the host of Konnichiwa Hawaii, Japanese talk show on ThinkTech Hawaii. Konnichiwa Hawaii is all Japanese broadcast show. And it's streamed live on ThinkTech at 2 p.m. every other Monday. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. I'm Yukari Kunisue. Mahalo. Hey, welcome back to Security Matters Hawaii. We're talking with Gary Hoffner of PSLA out in California. We were talking about the sort of the lay of the land from the voice of the integrator. Uh, Gary, you hosted a couple sessions recently in Denver that I wasn't able to attend on, an, on, an, on a piece of technology that's growing near and dear, I think, to our industry's hearts and I know to yours and mine, and that's cybersecurity. Um, I think you had a session entitled C Cyber Risk is Business Risk or something like that, and I didn't get to make it in there. Um, why don't you talk to us about how that, how that session came about in your concept and, and who helped out on the panel, maybe what got shared with that room. I think that's a, a I heard that was a really good session. Yeah, great. Thanks, Andrew. You know, it was, um, you know, it, it was, uh, it was delivering, de delivering information that, that really, I don't think most companies consider. A lot of people know now today what cyber is. If they don't, they should. Yeah. Yeah. Cybersecurity is becoming very, prolific in the news, uh, you know, you can't really go through a, a week without hearing about somebody that's been hacked. And in all reality, you know, one in four of us will be as, as businesses and 60% of all cyber attacks come through the supply chain. So mm. companies like yours, you know, I mean, so, so if, if uh, we are 
kind of, um, well, we're right in between the, the attackers and our customers. So, <laughs> so theoretically, we really should know, at least be aware of what's going on around. It. Sure. So, so what, what a, a lot of companies don't think about are, are more of the obscure risks you know, involved with cyber. There's the obvious risk, you know, operational and financial risk. Okay, we all know it costs money to get hacked. That's all there is to it. Okay. Uh, the operational side, we all know that it can, uh, you know, really render, you know, networks useless, uh, could uh, really uh, just eliminate your data, uh, uh, eliminate your recovery process. Uh, it can even, uh, it even makes machines just useless where you have to, forklift those in order to get your network back up and running. So, you know, just for security sake, so you don't re in, you know, reintroduce something into your network that you didn't know was hiding. Yeah. So there's the operational risk that's always there, but you don't think about the other operational risks that, uh, that, that, that many of these companies experience, you know, and, and those, that, that was a, that was a pretty spirited discussion about, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll tell, I'll, I'll, I'll take Hawaii, for example, because, you know, you guys are, genuinely warm there temperature wise <laughs> genuinely human there temperature wise and i bet there aren't a whole lot of office buildings there that don't have air conditioning yeah and i'm sure you agree so so let's just say for sake of the conversation that you know you had uh, a 600 person office and the air conditioning went out for three days yeah you know would, would that be would that be a place people would would could work or would want to work probably not yeah, yeah, I think they what? don't come in on day two for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so what if the lighting didn't work? You know, yeah. what if uh, doors didn't lock or unlock? Um, all these things, you know, generally controlled by network these days. And uh, when you think about the, the 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 safety related issues and the comfort related issues of working, um, and they you take them away, do you really have? A bona fide place to work. I, I don't think you do. And if your network is down, then how effective are you going to be remotely yeah. with remote workers? You know, so so there's a big operational cost involved with with being hacked there. You know, other than aside from just regular equipment damage things. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then we talked about also the the legal and reputational risks. I mean, mm -hmm. these are these are tremendous, tremendous. Um, uh, exposure uh, points in terms of in terms of cyber breaches, reputational in particular. You know, reputational, and you you know you pick any really high profile company, and it really depends on how they respond, what they say, when they respond to a hack. I mean, if you're uh, if you're responding. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna cite any examples because there's plenty of them out there. But if you're a large company and you're responding uh, two months after the attack <laughs> took place and data was lost, then you know the the public's perception of you and your company uh, is is pretty low in terms of okay, why are you telling me now, mm -hmm. and uh, why couldn't you tell me before? So what's missing that 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 uh, you weren't prepared for, mm -hmm. or if you have a major data breach, I know there was a there was a there was a big city on the on the East Coast. Um, I believe it was last June that had a ransomware attack. Yeah, Atlanta. And uh, this, yeah, exactly. And they were down for I think three or four days. And uh, <laughs> you know, it's like they couldn't yeah. they couldn't pay their all the government services were shut down. I mean, so what do you think the perception of you know the constituents, the city, the people who live in the city? What was what was their perception of their of their city, city leadership and their yeah. preparedness? You know, so all that stuff takes a takes a toll. Now, not so much with the city because you know what? I mean, there might be a couple of, that may or may not get reelected. There may be some city officials that might be looked at pretty hard, but you know, if people want to live there, they're going to live there. But if you're a commercial establishment or a retail outlet, mm. then Certainly, people have choices as to where they spend their money, and uh, you know the, the the harder the reputational damage, or the greater the reputational damage, I should say, is is uh, the, the greater propensity for people not sharing their money with you. So, particularly if their data was lost, and and uh, and uh, you you failed to notice notice them in a while. So, yeah, for, that for, that for issue of period. rebuilding trust, um, or or going from trusted to untrusted um, is, I don't think 
considered well. And was there any discussion of the sort of the valuation of that? I know like a Marriott lost about a billion dollars of market cap in that recent breach that they had. Um, was there discussion? I think you had uh, some lawyers or some from the attorney general's office in there on your panel. Was there a discussion yeah. of the cost of, of reputational trust, um, you know, recovering it? We, or is it years yeah. again? Or, you know, you can't we buy actually, it. That's a, that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish we would have spoke to that. I mean, we, we, I think we, we had such a, you know, you only had an hour. And uh, ah. to be honest with you, it was, it was such an invigorating discussion that we couldn't squeeze all the topics in that you would want to talk about. That would have been a great one, just to, just to set an, an index as to what the stuff really costs on the reputational side. We did talk about we and we did have um, we had uh, uh, Hannah Hofflinger who is uh, with Insure Trust and she is a legal advocate and uh, and, a, and a policy writer for the organization. We had uh, Wayne Dean who is a uh, well known in our industry and yep. in other industries uh, for his insurance work for cyber. We had uh, Sal Diagostino who is mm. uh, like the cyber guy. He's a really yeah. solid cyber guy, well known and uh, a lot of different creative. Uh, processes and pieces of equipment under his belt that he that he runs, and we had Paul Jacobson from Silver Jacobson. They're a uh, hmm. crisis management PR firm out of oh. DC and Denver, and uh, I, I think that uh, probably I think there's a lot of interest in the crowd because they had never heard from the public relations side about you know kind of mm -hmm. the do's and don'ts of what you didn't do, you know, after a hack. So, sure. uh, but the, but to quantify a hack, we didn't really quantify the hack, but we did we did. I think quantify that roughly 15% of all companies that are hacked go out of business. Ouch. So that was impressive. That was a, that was a big number. I think that was a cumulative effect of, you know, all the risks that they take in terms mm -hmm. of the, the, you know, the financial, legal, operational and reputational risk. So, wow. so it's a big risk. Did, um, was there discussion in the room about sort of like planning to recover? Did, did, did the audience or did anyone, you know, open up about their sort of, you know, time to get back to 100%? Have any, you know, did anybody discuss about those plans? Because I hear a lot of people buying, you know, bright, shiny tools to stop this and stop that. But I don't hear a lot of talk about an understanding of what, how do you get back from fully breached to fully operational? And how long is that going to take? Yeah, well, we 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 illustrated that there wasn't a lot of uh, mm. pan, there was there wasn't a lot of panel discussion about it, and there there, there wasn't a lot of um, rebuttal or discussion from the from the audience. Mm. But what we did do when we started the session, we started out by kind of polling everybody in in, in attendance there to find out who had a fully vetted, fully baked you know cybersecurity program within their company. I mean, uh, full governance. You know, from mm -hmm. uh, from the CEO down through the CISO down to the lower management, wow. uh, an awareness program, a detection program, a remediation program, a recovery program, and and only one person in the room actually raised their hand. Wow! Did and, you know him? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so just to give you a sense of of how ill prepared, you know, most of us are. I I I, I was an audience. I, I would not be with my hand either. To be perfectly wow. honest with you, I'll try. So, because it is a lot, there's a, there's a tremendous amount involved in getting prepared uh, for a cyber attack and to be, you know, and, and, and in your, your question for recovery, which is obviously one of the most important factors, you know, which, which really, if, if you're not prepared for being attacked, you're gen genuinely not prepared for recovery. Yeah. Um, we, we, had, uh, we had a customer um, uh, that had a pretty, pretty sizable attack in a not, uh, pretty re pretty recent history, and uh, you know I, I can tell you that um, they are still feeling the effects, and it's it's been I don't know we'll call it five weeks. Wow! So, so they're, still, they're still not one hundred percent. That's devastating. Well, we've got a yeah. couple minutes left, Gary. You want to give our audience your last prep, uh, the words of advice, or what, what can you share with them uh, from your sage chair there, and uh, that they can take home. Oh, well, you know what? I would say that uh, if if you're watching this because you're a system integrator or in our particular industry, then um, strongly consider your next two years and see how cybersecurity uh, fits into that for one, uh, your own organization, two, for the systems you deploy on your customers' networks, and for three, for actually offering it to your customers. 
uh, a combined package of physical and cybersecurity is is something that you know we feel is going to be almost commonplace in the in the not too distant future. If you're watching this from the perspective of, of a business owner or just an interested party, I would say that the more you can learn about cybersecurity preparedness, the more you can learn about uh, creating your own cyber cybersecurity program within um, within your company, uh, that 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 the better. Because as I said earlier, you know, 25% of us in four of us will be hacked. And, wow. you know, we don't know if it's going to be, a, you know, cost you 20 grand in ransomware or it's going to cost you, you know, 20 million in, in, in legal fees and lost business. So so it is uh, generally a big problem and the problem is much, much bigger, growing faster and much more well funded than the solution is today. Mm. That is some sage advice. Gary, thanks so much for joining us today out there. Get your cyber act together. We've been preaching this for a while. Okay, Gary, thanks for backing us up on that. Uh, aloha, you. everybody. Be safe out there because security matters. Thank you. Thank you.